when I was invited to do the project for Boots the Chemist. I ended up staying in the UK for two months or so at the request of Boots, uh, which uh, they would have denied the project uh, to our company unless I, the quote-unquote designer, stayed. And uh, why am I saying that to you? Because that's significant. Because what you're looking at, and you know, everyone calls Stonehenge, was created and designed by somebody like myself. As a, a linguist would, could pick up a few words and find one language to another, as a, a person who's into the science of dinosaurs could look at the bones and know if it's, it's a carnivore or not. Somebody like myself, if I put all the superstitions and all of these dogmas aside, it's for me it's not that difficult to see what Stonehenge is all about. But at the time I went there with my ex-wife and my, two of my kids, the third one was not born at that time. She was not my ex-wife, of course. Never mind that. Uh, so as I went there, at the time they didn't let us go past the car park area. For the first time in my life I had no clue. This was a mess of stones, didn't make any sense. And they were telling me it's a calendar and I was remembering calendars. Calendars have to go up to 12 and uh, uh, 24s or so on. It's just that uh, 30 stones didn't make sense. I saw the little two spots in the uh, car park area that was supposedly three stumps or whatever. Okay. And that just really disturbed me because I didn't even have the smallest idea. To then by luck, about two or three years ago, I'm sitting at home, it's winter, watching television, and suddenly both uh, National Geographic and Discovery Channel, both of them pump out two stories about Stonehenge. I think National Geographic's had the uh, they made this whole big boom thing out of it and I'm like watching to see what they get they figure out. I was watch it, they built it, the whole process was amazing how they used all those styrofoam to build the Stonehenge. And then one of the rocks they left short so as if it was a gate that bothered me. Because this thing looked like a circle. Then at one hour later was the Discovery Channel. Of course, they had their dowsers and all of that, and then they came back with a few pieces of fact that at that time I knew what it was. Right away. They knew exactly what it was, but it was like a revelation. They came up with two things, or three things, sorry. One with the inside walls were flat, the whole thing level, although the ground was not level, but the top of this thing was level, the stones were fitting, like a jigsaw puzzle with each other and they had this um, mortise and uh, tenon type of tongue and groove thing and I'm looking at this flat and this tongue and groove why would anybody go out of their way to do that and why the outside is not flat that's when I realized this is not a monument it never was a monument so I said okay this was a big wine making vat and they had wood on the inside and they just did that I said ah, nah not in UK and of those days. Uh, and, I, and in my head, of course, at this time, still UK is this misty, rainy place that it is now. And I remember Key West. They have a tank and they explained it to us that this is this basically a tank that in the old days before there was a bridge and all of that, they kept rainwater. And I figured it rains in UK. They filled up this with rainwater. Didn't make sense for two reasons. First of all, it doesn't rain like that in UK now. And then I realized this Ice Age UK or after Ice Age and probably was this place was more like 1960s Afghanistan or something like that. It was glaciers nearby. And that took me to Afghanistan when I was a kid and I was there and I could remember that they had something called Chishma, which was basically a, a spring and they would show up real large and uh, you could see there's a piece of water was oozing and they would put little rocks around it and we'll create a little pool about this deep and then as you would go on as spring went to uh, later and later towards summer this thing would shrink and they would keep moving the rocks or further in in and they would be, get real small till it disappeared in the summer and then started all over the bingo when I saw the whole ditch 
around this thing, I saw the avenue, which reminded me of Parmon, which is in Afghanistan again, which is over there, they decided not to paint, not pave the, when I, Afghanistan, when I say I'm talking about 60s and 70s Afghanistan, while the whole cobble was paved, and they didn't pave this town, which is on the side of a mountain, and all the water comes in from there, and they had two gutters on the two sides of the road, and they dumped with special shovels, water on it, I was like, okay, this avenue makes sense, water was oozing, there was glaciers there, and uh, there's seepage from underneath the ground, it was oozing on the surface of the ground, bingo, so they dug the ditch, but how did they come up with that? So I figured, there are these rocks all over the place, and in any farmer you know in New England, where I am here now, they usually moved them around as far as they could, and they made walls out of them, separated their property or whatever, what these are put there. And uh, uh, Karnak, perhaps, they stood it up and uh, just to get them out of the way because each one of those rocks could feed you for a day or two. I mean, the amount of cultivation. So, if you can't build a bridge out of the way, you usually stand up. It does two things. If you shade, you can grow shade stuff and create like a forest environment or others, like one or two of them usually becomes a landmark like a minaret or a church steeple or all those uh, towers in Egypt, they didn't have GPS back then. It was like a one or two of them would usually give you a good depth at where you were and which direction you were. And so they stood up these stones and at the same time, they tied up an animal with a loose rope around it, to, perhaps to graze so they wouldn't go anywhere. And the animal keep walking and cut the chalk in as they keep walking. And since this area was like a sponge cake, the water oozed around and of course people gathered up and then they ate around it and they start putting the, air, the bones of the animals at the bottom. Like it would look good at the same time that the mud wouldn't come up and the water stay cool because of the white bones. Trust me, they knew that the white bones were there. And that gives you these two spots that you see now perhaps. Then uh, they probably did a larger one. As you can see the big ditch that they created, they, one side of it was too low. They, created a bank, uh, embankment to level it and so on and kept going smaller and smaller and smaller as the area became dry. Then I believe that the tall ones were built and I explain all of that in the graphics coming up and uh, suddenly the drought was so much that there was the only two spots, one in the front, one in the back where the oval shape is, that's not a horseshoe, that's an oval shape, and I think the stones that they are, the so-called uh, heel stone and all of that was part of that, when it broke like a deluge of water, um, uh, took them all the way over there, and hence, I put together this graphic. This is as accurate as information one person, myself, I could get from. What we need to do is put together some uh, geologists to see the, what was going on under UK. Hey, you may never know this was a big oil vat that they let it off. I doubt it. I think you would have seen fire marks on it. But uh, this was water. Mm, uh, th this was, as in Afghanistan, cool drinking water just coming out of the ground. The blue was coming up. If anybody went to, uh, went to the Afghanistan shambles. But back then, if anybody remembers Afghanistan or any mountainous areas, this water is cool. You could drink it with your hands. All you need is a couple of rocks around it. They did this in a grand scale. And of course, they cleaned off the inside of these rocks, flat, so the wood would adhere to it. And my experiment I'm doing here shows you that how wood expands and the leather contracts. And uh, uh, as anybody studied Anglo-Afghan wars, you could see that a lot of leather bags were used to uh, carry people across the rivers, made out of uh, animal skins. And so today, water carriers in Afghanistan carry a all leather bag without any glue or anything. Leather itself is sewed together and as long as it stays wet, it uh, seals itself. Uh, in uh, lower areas like in uh, Middle East and Southern Europe, they used asphalt because they, a lot of asphalt used to bubble up on the sea and all of that uh, to s stop leaks. But on um, highlands like Afghanistan or modern day UK, this, but uh, this this goes beyond just Stonehenge. We're talking about the sea hinge and all of that at that time. Keep in mind that the sea level was down, so this was on dry land. And